Hi everyone, thanks so much for being here today and joining me as we talk about pain through a lens of narratives and ethics. Um, my name is Joletta Belton and I am a pain patient advocate and someone who has lived with pain for the last 10 years. I've written about my experiences on my blog, mycupofjoe.com, for the last six years or so, um, as I've tried to make sense of my, my own experiences and make meaning of the things that I've gone through, um, and also try to find a different way forward. And I'll talk about some of that throughout the talk today as well. But I really wanted to ground this talk in the social world. I'm taking a course right now called Global Health Case Studies from a Biosocial Perspective. And in that course, it was said that the social world defines who is at risk of being ill. So I really want to ground this in that social world because we often talk about the person who is living with pain and their biology and their psychology, and we kind of ignore the context that they're living in. And I really want to ground everything that we talk about today in that social world and in that context. We're gonna ground all of that social world in the realm of narratives too. We have long constructed narratives and stories about pain. Um, a really good book on that is Joanna Bork's The Story, I'm sorry, The Story of Pain from Prayer to Painkillers. So we've, we've had all of these stories about pain for centuries, about what it means, what we should do about it. But it goes beyond that too. And, and that's what I really want to delve into. We've long constructed stories about people too, which people are worthy, which people have rights, which people are deserving of care, and which people aren't. These narratives have changed over time. What we thought about people in pain in the Middle Ages is different than in the 17th century, which is different than during the birth of modern medicine in the 19th century, and it's different today. Yet remnants of all of those earlier times and earlier tales and earlier stories persist in those narratives that we have today about people and about pain. And those narratives are built into politics. You can read Keith Waylou's Pain, A Political History, or the more recent, which was just published, um, The Political Determinants of Health by Daniel Dawes, who I had the good fortune of seeing speak at a public health conference here in Colorado a couple of years ago. But those narratives are also built into to policies, into education, into the practice of medicine, into beliefs and attitudes, into the ways that we treat our fellow humans. And what are those stories we tell about pain today? What are those stories that we tell about people? And what are the stories that we tell about people in pain? And it goes beyond just ourselves and our own personal narratives as individuals. These narratives are built into systems, into institutions, into professions, into cultures, and into our societies. And they all have these biases, all these remnants of those stories told in our past. And that affects how people with pain are thought of. It affects how they are treated. And it also affects how people in pain think of themselves and how they experience their reality. So it's not just stories. You know, this is how we make sense of the world. All of us, not just patients, but the clinicians who treat patients too, the policymakers who develop policies, the politicians um, who, who are looking at this from a more public health perspective. When I'm talking about stories too, I wanna to be clear that even randomized controlled trials tell a story. There's an introduction or a literature review. There's a discussion and a conclusion. If there were no story told, it would just be methods and results, just the facts. But it's not. Subjectivity and story are imbued in every quantitative study, every interpretation of data, every hypothesis generated, every scientific or philosophical philosophical or economical discussion, all are which grounded, are grounded in the foundations of previous stories told and previous knowledge that's been socially constructed and agreed upon and built upon. But traditionally in healthcare, that the narratives that are privileged, the narratives that are the only voice that counts tend to be that, that healthcare practitioner voice, the monological voice, 
Um, and, and that is the one that is privileged and, and legitimized, whereas patient voices and patient stories are kind of dismissed and, and disregarded. Speaking of that social construction of knowledge, um, in 1966, sociologists Peter Berger and Thomas Luckman published The Social Construction of Reality. Um, and in that, they define sociology of knowledge as whatever passes for knowledge in a society, regardless of the ultimate validity or invalidity by whatever criteria of such knowledge. When people come together, they form a shared mental conception about the world. And this is, you know, when any group of people come together, including, you know, scientists or healthcare professionals. When they find themselves together, they construct norms that govern their relations. When newcomers come into that group, they experience those kind of historicized natural habits as natural rules. And any assumptions and accidents that have become historicized into truths um, are a part of the knowledge that is created. Whether it was valid or invalid at the time, that is all determined by the social context and political context of the time. And just having an awareness of that, of how both knowledge and policy and all of these things are socially constructed really can help us to take a, a self-reflective approach, a more critical approach to how we conceptualize health and disease and where those ideas come from, and where our own beliefs come from where our own beliefs and attitudes and approaches come from when we treat people who are living with pain, talk with people who are living with pain, or talk about people who are living with pain. We own, our own stories that we tell. Um, from, from that same text, this is from the textbook from that course I was mentioning. Um, the textbook is called Reimagining Global Health, an introduction. Um, they further say, when transformed into policies backed by organizations with claims of authority, Legit legitimized knowledge comes to exert social control over individuals. Social constructions become naturalized over time as if they were invariant parts of the nature of things. This is the, this is the way we've always done it kind of approach. And it's about questioning the way that we've always done things and the way we've always conceptualized things. From the same course and the same text, Beyond the direct experiences of individuals are social, political, and economic forces that drive up the risk of ill health for some while sparing others. Some have called this structural violence. Such social, such social forces become embodied as health and disease among individuals. I think that's so important, that structural violence, that social forces become embodied as health and disease among individuals. That it's not just individual failings. It's not just about that individual. It's about that social world defining who becomes ill and who recovers, and who is defined as resilient and who is defined as, as weak. This notion of structural violence was conceived by Paul Farmer, who is the co-author of this textbook. And he came up with it after he observed the links between poverty and ill health in Haiti. Um, and it can be conceived of as a, a form of social suffering. Farmer writes that such suffering is structured by historically given and often economically driven processes that force and forces that conspire, whether through routine, ritual, or as is more commonly the case, the hard surfaces of life to constrain agency. For many, including most of his patients and informants, Choices both large and small are limited by racism, sexism, political violence, and grinding poverty. So this all contributes to how that social world defines who becomes ill. And this forms a basis for that socially constructed knowledge that I was talking about as well. Further, institutions and their agents can perpetuate violence in the name of health and welfare. Social forces, including economics, politics, social institutions, social relationships, and culture can cause pain and suffering to individuals. And when structural violence is overlooked, agency is often overestimated and constraint underestimated. We tend to put it all on individuals without viewing those individuals within their broader sphere of influences, including those societal and medical narratives that I was talking about earlier and those constraints by institutions, bureaucracies, politics, policies, 
including things like institutionalized racism, colorism, sexism, systemic biases, xenophobia, homophobia. Um, there, are, there are so many things that, that contribute to the way we think about people, the way we think about pain, the way we think about people in pain, and the way that we treat them as well. So I, I just wanted to provide all of that kind of as this, this background understanding of, of all knowledge being socially constructed and agreed upon. And that is all based on the, you know, the, the current state of the world at the time, the current state of, of that group of people who are coming together to legitimize certain forms of knowledge and certain narratives over others. Um, as, as we go through and kind of talk about healthcare specifically and how all of this relates to people in pain even more so. In terms of those, those metaphors and those social narratives that we have about pain and medical narratives that we have about pain, we have some very common metaphors. Um, and speaking of that overestimation of, of agency in that previous slide, there are some, some common metaphors in healthcare that tend to lay blame at the feet of patients when treatment is not successful. And it's kind of built into the narratives that, that are the foundation of of how we kind of understand medicine. Even if we, we fight these, we still base, form the basis of our understanding of medicine. And that first one is medicine is war. That pain is the enemy and the patient is the battlefield. Um, technology is the weapon. So the more technology we can use, the better. And the clinician is the hero. We are hearing this narrative right now with the coronavirus pandemic too, that, that we are fighting this war against coronavirus. We hear about the war on cancer. There's, in, within medicine, medicine is war metaphor is very, very prevalent. Stephen Loftus, who, who I kind of drew these metaphors from um, his work, The Pain and Its Metaphor, the dialogical approach. He writes of how medicine, is the, the medicine is war metaphor can blind us to ethical issues as much is excused when we're in a state of war. Much can be let go when we're in a state of war that wouldn't otherwise be let go. Um, we can kind of lose sight of, of ethics under a warlike kind of mentality. And within this, this metaphor, where pain is the enemy and the patient is the battlefield and technology is seen as weapons and the clinician is the hero, when the battle is not won, when the enemy pain is not vanquished, within this metaphor, it is the patient then that has failed rather than the treatment or the technology or the clinician. Another very common metaphor is the body is, is a machine. Um, and this is one that, I, a, a metaphor that I used all the time when I was a firefighter and a peer fitness trainer. The body is a machine. It was all about optimizing that machine. Um, and it's another very common biomedical, biomechanical metaphor. And, and this is, you know, pain is a result of some mechanical damage occurring to the body machine. And it becomes the duty of the patient to then hand their body over to a health professional who can locate the cause of the damage, which is then fixed or repaired or realigned or replaced. So with this metaphor, the clinician is then the, the technician, the one that is doing too. And the, the patient is that passive recipient that hands over their, their body to be done to. Um, in both of these metaphors, that, that kind of worried person in pain seeking care doesn't matter in either of them. Their body is a machine or their body is the battlefield. Um, their body in, is the only thing that counts. So they're dehumanizing metaphors. They're taking the person out of the equation and just focusing on the body or the physical or the what is real, the what is what can be seen and measured. And, when I say real, I'm saying that with quotes because obviously the rest of it is real as well. They're problematic metaphors. And even if we've tried to move beyond them, like I know many of you watching this right now have, they're still a part of our foundational knowledge about pain and health that has been passed down to us. It is up to us then to construct and pass on new knowledge. So that's what I'm, I'm going to talk more about in future slides. Um, before I move on, though, Loftus also writes that this, this sort of problem can be seen as a conflict between two opposing metaphors of healthcare. One is that medicine is applying science, and the other that is 
medicine is healing people. When we look at medicine as healing people, which is another common metaphor within in the medical field, um, our approach might be a little bit different. Rather than the body as a machine, the body might be seen as an ecosystem. Rather than medicine is war, medicine might be more about service. And this is just to highlight that, that we have a choice in the metaphors that we use and the metaphors that we operate under. And we need to make conscious and critical judgments about what those metaphors are in any particular situation. Uh, anyone who has ever read any of my writing or seen me in my other presentations knows I'm really keen on language and the language that we use and recognizing the importance that the words that we use matter. And these metaphors, this language that we use, really matters. Um, the medicine is war and body is a machine and medicine is applying science metaphors all highlight that persistent mind-body dichotomy that is still the water that we're swimming in, it's still the water that our, our societies are swimming in. People still think that if they experience pain, they just go and have the source of that pain found and fixed. They're very, very pervasive metaphors. And as long as bodies are machines, patients are at risk of becoming two o'clock hips. Um, this was a, a sketch that my friend Sula made for me based on an experience that I had in the physical therapy clinic where the very kind woman behind the front desk told the, the physical therapist waiting for me that, that his two o'clock hip was there. And it, it was such a dehumanizing moment for me to have gone from becoming, from being a firefighter and a paramedic and being very strong and being, um, you know, sort of a, a badass and a hero to just being reduced down to a two o'clock hip. But that's all I was, was this problematic hip that was getting punted from clinic to clinic and clinician to clinician because nobody could figure it out. Eric Cassell writes about how medicine's mind-body dichotomy is a source of the paradoxical situation in which clinicians cause suffering in their care of patients. So long as the mind-body dichotomy is accepted, suffering is either subjective and thus not truly real, or, and not within medicine's domain, or is identified exclusively as that bodily pain that can be fixed or realigned or repaired or replaced. Not only is, this is continuing Cassell's quote, not only is such an identification misleading and distorting, for it depersonalizes the sick person, but is itself a source of suffering. And that is so, so important for us to recognize that this language isn't just important because to, to provide an accurate, picture of what is happening, but it can also be a source of suffering, and we need to take that into consideration as well. Eric Cassell also says in this paper that I love, The Nature of Suffering and the Goals of Medicine, that it is not possible to treat sickness as something that happens solely to the body without thereby risking damage to the person. So it is not possible to treat sickness as something that happens solely to the body without thereby risking damage to the person. Even the term biopsychosocial still reduces the person down to parts and processes in a mind-body dualism dichotomy with the bio being the hard science, the real science, and the psychosocial being soft science. So that bio being real and hard science is also a very na narrow view of what biology is. That, and that very narrow view is privileged above all else. It's the anatomy, the biomechanics, the tissues, the processes and behaviors that we can see and measure, and all else is sort of dismissed. We kind of forget about like, the field of ecology when it comes to biology and the interconnectedness of all of this, and not just within the, the, the body of the person, but in the interactions with the environment as well. All of those things that we can't measure, all of those things that we can't see, are then devalued and de-emphasized because it, it's not so neatly quantified. But just because we can't see it on a scan or measure it with a gadget, that doesn't make it any less real. And talking about this too, in, in terms of that term biopsychosocial, um, and 
I had phrased it as biosocial earlier. If our psychology is not made of biology, where is it? What is it made of? Does it take place somehow outside of our bodies? How then does it interact with our body if it's not a part of our body and made of the same biological stuff that the rest of our body is made of? So this persistent dualism, this water that we swim in, this dichotomy between mind and body, is an old story still present today that infuses so much of our education, so much of our language, so much of our thoughts and attitudes, um, so much of that socially constructed knowledge that our understanding of pain and people with pain is based on. And it perpetuates suffering and contributes to the ongoing trauma of care. When the person no longer matters, when they are reduced down to their parts, to being a two o'clock hit, when they're reduced down to the processes that are happening in their body and they're never put back together into a whole, we cannot provide ethical care. So how do we bridge those gaps? How do we provide more ethical care that takes into account not just the parts and processes of a person, but the person as a complex soul, living within a complex world, and both person and world both having complex histories. So I think that narrative medicine, the social sciences, and the humanities provide some possibilities. And I'm particularly going to explore narrative and dialogue and conversation. Michelle Clifton Soderstrom, who wrote Levinas and the Patient is Other, The Ethical Foundation of Medicine, wrote, if medical care does not attempt to value persons wholly, to treat persons ethically and justly, the medical practice has lost the value that fueled it from the start, that of bettering health. Narrative practices are one way to prevent medical care from viewing persons primarily within the categories of science. Persons always transcend scientific knowledge. The human other is the one whom medicine serves, making the face-to-face -face encounter the most fundamental and irreducible aspect of medical care. Without persons, the practice of medicine has no meaning. So Howard Brody, who this paper that this quote comes from, my story is broken, can you help me fix it? Medical ethics and the joint construction of narrative is one of my favorite papers of all time and really started to help me see my own story a bit differently and my own kind of process through, through um, you know, my first twinge of my hip that led to this ongoing pain and then Kind of recovering and getting better through that pain it, it was it was his pe paper that allowed me to kind of provide a, a framework for what i thought better care could look like um, and allowed me some some new insights into my own experiences but he writes that the physician the physician depending upon how well she listens to the patient and what sort of atmosphere she creates in the interview has substantial power to alter the patient's health status for better or for worse how the patient, excuse me, how the physician uses that power is an important ethical question for medicine. So there's great power in that ability to listen and that atmosphere that is created in that therapeutic encounter and how that power is used is an important ethical question for medicine. So that those are big questions that we can ask. What atmosphere has been created? What story are we telling? Not just me as the patient telling you my story, but what story are you telling too? Are you thinking of me in terms of anatomy, my diagnosis, my biomechanics, my presentation, my history, my imaging? Are you thinking of me as a two o'clock hit? Note the, the dehumanization in that, and not just the dehumanization, but the possession. Whose hip is it? My hip or your hip? Do I hand my hip over to you for your inspection and scrutiny, your objectification and classification? Do I hand over my agency? And also, what story am I telling? How have I made sense of my experiences? What gaps might there be that you can help me to fill? What, what dots can you help me connect? David Morris wrote about how narrative ethics holds a special relevance to pain when ethics is understood to concern values. What are my values? You know, what are those, those values that I can reconnect with in a different way, perhaps, than I did before, and move towards them 
rather than away from them, which is what often happens with pain when we become more socially disconnected and more withdrawn and isolated within kind of our, our world of pain. Words also convey that values. And lack of words can convey values too. Patients regularly complain that doctors do not believe that their pain is real. Why is that? Why do so many patients feel invalidated? Jack Coulihan states that the more a patient and their story is objectified, the less relevant they become to their own care. They just become a problem to solve, a machine to optimize. Those are my words. Yet it is now widely recognized that our words, our language, our stories have a power to heal or to harm. And when narrative competence is lacking, when patients are not heard, not seen, not believed, not valued, not validated, our words and metaphors and stories are more likely to do harm than good. Howard Brody also wrote that the clinician's words can promote healing or increase the patient's suffering. So then I ask, which is the more ethical route? And I'm hoping that that increasing healing or promoting healing would be the route that we would want to take and that that can highlight why narrative is so important and why narrative competence is so important. Like I said, this is one of my favorite papers, so I, I'm, I quote Howard Brody a lot. Um, but healthcare professionals in general tend to underestimate just how much we understand our pain, how we humans understand our pain and ourselves and our place in the world in a narrative way. We tell stories about everything, about ourselves, about our jobs, about our families, about our, our past and our histories, about our future. We, we understand ourselves through narrative and through story whether we acknowledge it or not. According to Brody, when we are seeking care, the clinician should adopt as a working hypothesis that the patient is asking a question something like this, that something is happening to me that seems abnormal, and either I cannot think of a story that will explain it, or the only story I can think of is very frightening. Can you help me to tell a better story, one that will cause me less distress about this experience? Or, put more simply, my story is broken. Can you help me fix it? When we're in pain, especially ongoing pain that does not resolve, that does not respond to treatment like it was supposed to, when we don't get better like we should have, we are trying to make sense of often life and world upending pain, life and world upending circumstances. We are trying to figure out who we are and who we can be with this pain we are trying to put order to the chaos that we're living in. We are trying to be understood, and we're also trying to understand. This is important because on the part of the clinician, there's always this deeply rooted need to know. The need to know what we're going through in order to come up with a diagnosis, to come up with a plan. And on our part, there's an equally deep need to be known. We need to understand and we also need to be understood. And through this exchange between the clinician and the person seeking care, we can begin to understand the person and the pain because those two things cannot be separated. You cannot understand the pain separate from the person. And that person in pain through being understood can then begin to heal. You know, but it, it takes that being heard and being seen and being understood first. When we do feel seen and heard and understood and believed, then we have a new capacity within ourselves to be able to take in more information, more of what you're telling us. And we're able to see from other perspectives. That can only happen, I'm sorry, I just jumped ahead a bunch. That can only happen um, when we feel known and understood. Only then can we begin to understand ourselves. We all have stories about pain, um, stories that do not typically objectify pain in the same way that biomedicine does. When asked to tell our stories about pain, we typically don't refer to, to like circles on a body chart with different you know, qualities um, highlighted in, in different ways, like hash marks or stripes or lines. And we don't refer to to all of the qualitative 
markers of pain on the McGill pain questionnaire. Morris, David B. Morris, in this narrative and pain towards an integrative model paper, writes about how pain emerges mainly as a verbal lived experience situated within a complex social world. It's a really hard thing to boil down to uh, intensity scale or any sort of questionnaire. Not that those don't have a place, but that's never going to be the complete picture. Such narratives, he writes, in their telling, infiltrate and modify the very pain they describe. And those descriptions are constantly changing, not just day by day, but moment by moment and from situation to situation. He further writes that a patient's narrative, no matter how uncertain, no matter how intersubjective, no matter how interactive, is often the best evidence available for understanding that pain and finding that way forward. And that's because pain is not found in our bodies. It's not found on a scan. It's not found in a diagnosis or disorder or dysfunction. It's found in our lives. It affects every aspect of our lives. Every relationship, every social role, every belief, every past, every future, every present. The world is not how we believed it to be. And some people might relate to that right now with what we're going through with the pandemic. The world is not how we believed it to be. Our world and ourself have been upended, made incoherent, it has eroded. Pain is so unbelievably nuanced and complex, and it's situated within this nuanced and complex social world, and it's conveyed through the stories we tell. The stories that we tell to ourselves, the stories that we tell to others, the stories that we live, and those stories in the telling create our very selves. Or perhaps even more telling for some people can be the absence of story or the inability to tell a story about our experiences, which is also really, really important to recognize as well. Not being able to put words to your experience provides valuable insights into that person's experience too. So I've been talking about narrative a lot. So what the heck do I even mean when I'm saying that? Um, in that same paper, Morris quotes philosopher and novelist Richard Kearney's definition um, of narrative, which comes from the Latin narrow, N-A-R-R-O, which means to tell. And his definition is someone telling something to someone about something. So that's, that's what I mean. Someone telling something to someone about something. That's what narrative is. And it takes two to story. It takes two to convey that narrative. It requires a teller and it requires a listener too. And in this telling and listening, there, it leads to this inner subjective knowledge. And that inner subjective knowledge is wholly different from how we typically categorize and dismiss patient stories as merely subjective or just anecdote. Morris writes of how this inner subjectivity escapes from solipsism because individual claims then enter into this intersubjective space, this third space, as John Quintner calls it. This social realm, where what is said can then kind of be tested and contested along other forms of evidence, where hypotheses can be posed and tested and refined. So it's not just a mere anecdote. This is, this is the person's life that they are trying to tell you. And it is evidence, like Moore said, often the best evidence that we have. One important note that I want to make, though, before I dive a little bit further into types of narratives um, that Arthur Frank has kind of categorized, is that the importance of listening to people's stories shouldn't come, become just another routine task, just another box to check or another tool in the toolbox. Um, he writes that when listening becomes a task, instead of what Rachel Naomi Remen calls a gift, much of its therapy, therapeutic efficacy is lost. So if it just becomes another thing to do within that therapeutic encounter, it kind of loses that therapeutic effect. So it all boils down to narrative is telling something to someone about something, but the ways in which we do that telling, that the ways that we tell that something differ. And so I'm gonna delve a little bit deeper into the narratives that some people with pain tell using Arthur Frank's narrative types. Oops, I messed up my animations here. Um, before I go into these narrative types, it's also important to note that these are not all of the types of narratives out there, that this isn't the only categories or frameworks that one could use when thinking about stories. 
Um, it's just one way that, that could be useful or not of looking at patient stories and seeing kind of where they might be. The three narrative types are also not mutually exclusive. Um, they're intertwined and shifting with one being more prominent at any given time, but they can, it's a fluid thing and, and not a linear process. Um, just as the experience of pain itself is ever shifting and nuanced and complex, so is the, the telling of that pain experience. There are no stages to move through, so this isn't a linear process, even though I'm gonna kind of present it as a linear process here because that's kind of how I moved through them. Um, but there shouldn't be this conception of I need to move this patient, this patient or this person from this type of narrative to another. Um, it's just, it, that's just another form of fixing, um, another way of exerting power and control over, over the patient. Um, and it can then become another way of pathologizing just normal human experience and normal ways of responding to really, really difficult and complex situations. So restitution is the most preferred na narrative in medicine. Um, and this is where the ill or the pained person is restored to their former, former self through the power of medicine. Um, so that, that medicine is war and, and body is a machine kind of metaphors all come to fruition. The patient was this battlefield. The clinician was the hero that acted upon that patient and restored them back to themselves, restored them back to, to health. The chaos narrative is diametrically opposed to the restitution narrative. It is the abyss, the darkness, the pain cave, as it's been called by, by some friends of mine, where nothing has worked. No one can tell us why it hasn't worked or what is wrong or what we should do about it. And nothing makes sense. And the present is just endless suffering and hope in the future are the loss. And this type of narrative is kind of characterized by and then, and then, and then. And we're gonna go into all of these a little bit, bit more through the lens of my, my own story. The third type of narrative that Arthur Frank talks about are quest narratives. And this is when we've made sense of our experiences and kind of given meaning to our suffering and gained insights into what has happened to us. Um, that can then be passed on to others. Frank describes quest narratives as those where a life is fashioned um, in which illness is neither accepted, which he thinks is too passive of a word, nor is it welcomed, um, which kind of romanticizes illness, and that's not the intention of quest narratives either. And these are more characterized by, I can now. So this is what I can do now. Most of us, when experiencing a health crisis or pain or illness of any sort, kind of start with this restitution narrative that we are going to go seek care, we are going to receive treatment for whatever it is that, that we are having an issue with. For me, it was hip pain, um, and then we're going to be restored to ourselves. Um, at this point in time, for me, as I, as I went along through this process and this quest for, for the fix, this quest for the Holy Grail, as Fran Toy and colleagues have put it, um, my story was just a repetition of symptoms, a story of questionnaires and circles on body charts of all the treatments that I'd been through and all the treatments that I failed, of what my pain severity was um, on the, the vast scales and um, of what I was doing for my pain now and what worked and what didn't. It was just this, this constant recit recitation of what had been done in the past and didn't work, what I was doing now. And it was a very symptoms focused and very, very much about my hip. It was not my story. It was more of a story of a medical file, a story of a problematic hip that didn't respond to treatment. Um, and I was completely lost in the mix through all of that. Um, and, and all that I had lost along the way was of no consequence to those that were, were in charge of my care at the time. The lost career, the lost purpose, the lost meaning, the lost relationships, the lost financial security, the lost future. My lost self was never on any of those questionnaires or charts that I filled out. And for me, the more I went through this process, the more none of it made sense. Um, the fix I was promised over and over again was, was never, would never came to fruition. And I was certainly not restored, but I was left with a lot of labels. Um, weak, that was my, the, the earliest ones that I was, was told that it was that my hip was weak. And then over time, you know, you're just told you're weak. And you're not sure if that means if you're weak of, of 
just in your hip or if you're weak of constitution, you're weak of character and that's why you're not getting better. I was labeled with all sorts of dysfunctions. I had SI joint dysfunction, I had movement dysfunctions, I had dysfunctions up the wazoo. I was unstable, my hip was unstable, my, my core was unstable, I had all kinds of instability things. I was constantly working on stability and strength. I was out of alignment, so doing a lot of things to get myself realigned, get myself strong, get myself stable, realigned, and make myself functional. I had a lot of no's in my paperwork. I couldn't, you know, squat, run, climb, be in awkward positions, lift more than 10 or 20 or 40 pounds. It kept changing, but it was all these no's that it eventually became a part of my belief system about myself and what I was capable or not capable of doing was damaged eventually, you know, eight, nine months in, was diagnosed with femoral acetabular impingement and a label tear and, uh, and all of these things. And I had annular tears in my spine. So then I was, I was labeled with all of these, these things that had been found on scans. Um, I was labeled as a failure that I had failed all these treatments. I failed physical therapy and I failed injections. I failed surgery. I failed, I failed all the things. And then after all of this, after years of going through all these processes, um, I was labeled permanent and stationary, a medical legal term within the, the workers' compensation world that essentially says you're never going to get better. And I was given an 11% disability rate. So in that, in traditional, you know, these restitution narratives that are very popular in medicine and, and what everyone hopes is going to happen, that they're going to be restored to their formal selves, um, I definitely was not. And the clinical, medical, and scientific narratives were the only ones that counted. My story just became a recitation of all of these different things. I have a weak hip. I have a torn labrum. I have SI joint dysfunction. I have X, Y, and Z movement dysfunctions. I can't do all of these things because my workers' compensation paperwork says that I can't. I am damaged. I'm out of alignment. I'm never going to get better, and I am this much disabled. And all of those were things that were given to me that became my story, but I had lost total agency within the telling of those stories. It was the clinicians and the physicians and the nurses and the therapists who, who were the active players in that story. And I was just kind of this passive, sitting on the sidelines person, even though ostensibly it was about me. I, I do want to make it clear that the restitution narrative isn't a bad narrative, and, and Arthur Frank writes that the restitution narrative represents the triumphant optimism of medical science, a science that has saved his own life, and a commitment to the idea of cure deserves to be honored. The problem occurs when we love the idea of restitution to the point of demonizing illness, or in my case, pain, when we believe that no other narratives are legitimate, when we then pathologize other stories as depressing, or as symptoms of depression. The deeply ill, whose immediate reality does not include restitution, are further marginalized. Those who have no story that society judges as worth telling feel they have no place in society. The restitution narratives aren't bad, and a lot of people are restored, but it's, it's when restitution is no longer possible that problems come in, and when we, we deny the possibility of other narratives, um, that it becomes a problem. And, I certainly was not restored to my former self, and all I was left with was all of these labels and all of these no's. Um, Jack Houlihan writes that words, perhaps spoken with the best of intentions, which I am sure every single one of these words was, can cause iatrogenic harm. And a great deal of suffering as well. Um, in that paper, The Nature of Suffering and the Goals of Medicine, Eric Cassell writes that the relief of suffering, it would appear, is considered one of the primary ends of medicine by patients and laypersons, but not by the medical profession. Whereas patients and their friends and families do not make a distinction between physical and non-physical sources of suffering um, in the same way that doctors do. So for me, in all of that search for restitution and all of those labels that I got as a part of that process, that normal kind of biomedical process, it led to a great deal of suffering. And, and that suffering was the, the more important problem at the time. When I look back at things now, it was all of the losses and all of the fears for the, the, the so uncertain future 
um, where, I mean, I had lost my career, my financial security, my friends, my future. Where was I going to go from there? I had lost my identity as a firefighter paramedic. And that's a very distressing place to be because I didn't know who I was without that title, that label, that profession. Suffering, Cassell further says, is experienced by persons, not merely by bodies. And it has a source and has its source in challenges that threaten the intactness of the person as a complex social and psychological entity. Suffering can include physical pain, but is by no means limited to it. The relief of suffering and the cure of disease must be seen as twin obligations of the medical profession that is truly dedicated to the care of the sick. We tend to just focus on that cure, that restitution, restoring people back to themselves through the, the the glory of modern medicine, the technologies of modern medicine. We kind of ignore or dismiss or don't even recognize how much suffering plays a role and how much the relief of suffering should be a dual aim of the medical profession, of healthcare profession. Again, back to Howard Brody. He writes, at the heart of suffering is a feeling that what ought to be whole is being split apart. This feeling may be experienced as a split between oneself and one's malfunctioning body, or as an isolation of the self from the human community. And when I read this, I was like, yes, like that is everything. That is so much of where my suffering came from. Not only did I, with those medicine is, is war type metaphors, pain was the enemy, which meant that my own body was the enemy. And, and my leg itself started to feel completely different to the point where where the sensations that I felt in my leg were completely skewed and obscured, and I wouldn't even know if my foot was touching the ground because I had so dis disassociated from my leg and so, so hated it for what it had done to me, for allowing this enemy pain in that had so disrupted my life and upended my world. Elaine Sperry also writes that pain brings about an absolute split between one sense of one's own reality in the reality of other persons. And again, it's that sense of split. I was split apart from, from my body, my leg, my hip, and I was also so isolated and withdrawn and split apart from humanity as well, and split apart from the reality of other persons. My world was no longer other people's worlds. It was very small and dark and confined and isolated. Eric Cassell defines suffering as the severe distress we experience when we perceive the impending destruction of our person, the loss of roles that had defined us, and the loss of the future. Arthur, Arthur Frank refers to the loss of the future too, that those chaos narratives, that when we're in the abyss, when we're in the, the pain cave, we have this sense of loss of a viable future, that there is no viable future. Cassell writes that hope dwells in the future, and great suffering attends the loss of that hope. And that suffering is exacerbated when our experiences, our stories are denied or attempted to just be replaced. When our pain is invalidated, when we are invalidated, we become split apart from humanity, from others, from the world, and we're stuck in bodies that have become the enemy, that are foreign and alien and unfamiliar and unknown to us. So that was my chaos. And in, in terms of these narratives, I want to make it clear, too, that chaos narrative is not a personal or a social failure, um, which is another way of like just pathologizing stories now rather than pathologizing movement or pathologizing tissues. Um, these are val valid narratives. They're, they're very human narratives, even if they're very uncomfortable narratives for us to hear as the listener. So I guarantee to you that they're way more uncomfortable to live for the person who was trying to, to, to make sense of that chaos. They're the narratives that we most want to get away from when we hear them and the ones that we most want to change, where we want to jump in and, and help the person through that or fix it for them, which is no different than jumping in to try to fix movement or posture or any of those other things. These chaos narratives are kind of an incoherent story of incomplete sentences. And we're the, the passive recipients of everything that is happening. Everything is happening to us. And then something else happens. And then something else happens. And it tends to be this, 
downward spiral of events of worsening and worsening and worsening things happen. For me, I felt a twinge in my hip and then I went to the OC doc and then I took muscle relaxants and I went to the PT and then the pain got worse and then I went off on work comp and I had injections and then I had surgery and then I had more physical therapy and then I did all sorts of things like chiropractic, massage, yoga, acupuncture, ergosphere, and then I was told I was permanent and stationary, never get better. And that I then I medically retired from firefighting, the career that had defined me. And then I worked in a civilian position, but the pain never got better and I hated a civilian position. And then I separated from my fire department altogether and then I was lost and confused and sad and isolated and hopeless. And it's just this constant series of amens and amens and amens. And, 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 and we can't make sense of it and we can't put order to the chaos. So it's not a very good story. <laughs> it's not a story that people want to listen to. It's not, a, it's not a story that I tell now when I'm telling my story. And Morris writes about how chronic pain can often become the, this old kind of confining pattern of the story, this and then, and then, and then. Um, and that confining pattern can kind of imprison us in those narratives of disability and spoiled identity, which, which that was my narrative for a long time, that losing my identity became kind of imprisoned in that narrative for a long time. But part of the reason we get stuck in those patterns is because we're not able to give voice to those experiences. Um, our narratives are uncomfortable. Those narratives are uncomfortable. So they are often attempted to be fixed or replaced by very well-meaning healthcare professionals or friends or family members. We are told that it can't be that, that bad, that other people have it worse, that other people had the same thing and got better, all of which are, are well-intentioned, but they can deny our story in that moment, which can deny our existence and just kind of further that dehumanization. And part of that is likely because of fear, you know, the, the fears of the listener, and that the fear of the unknown. Um, we don't like stories of distress and pain and suffering, um, especially in today's social media age where everything is YOLO and living my best life and, and everyone's putting their best face forward on social media. Although it's kind of changing now with the, the pandemic. Um, Arthur says that if culture loves the restitution narrative more than any other, I'm sorry. If culture loves the restitution narrative that any illness can be cured, it fears the chaos narrative that with illness trouble must multiply. The chaos narrative that cannot be told is about how thin the ice upon which we skate is and how cold and deep is the water into which we can suddenly sink. And if, if it can happen to me, then it can happen to you. And that's a very scary thing too. This chaos narrative with this vision of how awful life can get threatens you know our own visions of what health is and and who we are and how strong and capable and resilient that we might be um so these narratives are super super uncomfortable um and and so they tend to be denied or dismissed or or people just don't want to hear them and and that can just further the suffering of the person who's still living in that chaos to deny my living truth to deny my chaos serves only to intensify my suffering. But this doesn't mean that you have to deny that things can change, because they can change. So it's about accepting that story of chaos and suffering without trying to fix it, while also holding space for that idea that things can change. Um, but sometimes we need to be able to tell that story over and over again, that repetition, that and then, and then, and then, to finally be able to break free of it and see a different way of telling it, in a different way of, of looking at, at what we have been through. Um, it's only in being able to tell it in all its incoherence and get some distance from it that we might be able to see it with new eyes and gain some new perspective through the telling. Um, and then with that new perspective, then maybe we can start telling a different story and start living a different story. And now, obviously, my story is no longer chaos. A story that can be told is not chaos, but we still must honor those, those chaos narratives, those stories of suffering. Um, and it, again, so much of that is also based in that, <clears throat> excuse me, that social world, those, those more broader narratives that we have about who is deserving of care and who is deserving of being heard and listened to. And there's many of us, myself included, who are privileged and, and get to tell our stories. And there are so many people who don't. And we have to be, um, be able to serve those people by, by being able to sit with their suffering and their, their chaos.
one of the other things that is, is common in the language of healthcare is that we're poor historians or that we're non-compliant or non-adherent, that we are difficult or challenging patients. Um, and I want to challenge that, especially for those who are still living in the chaos. They're not difficult patients. They're not challenging patients. They're living through very difficult and challenging times, through very difficult and challenging situations. And they're trying to make sense of that. They're trying to make sense of, of this pain. And Drew Letter, who wrote the paper, The Experiential Par Paradoxes of Pain, which is an excellent paper, wrote that pain is far more than an aversive sensation. Chronic pain, in particular, involves the sufferer in a complex experience filled with ambiguity and paradox. The tensions thereby established, the unknowns, pressures, and oscillations form a significant part of the painfulness of pain. There are so many paradoxes when living with pain. Um, and, and making sense of all of that ambiguity and those paradoxes is a really difficult thing to, to try to come to terms with those unknowns and the pressures and the day-by-day and moment-by-moment oscillations of pain is a difficult thing to do. So people are not poor historians. They're not non-compliant or non-adherent. Um, they're not not motivated. It's one of the things that breaks my heart the most when I hear people who are living in the chaos are waking up every single day. They are motivated by, motivated by something. And it is finding out what those motivations are, finding out what those values are. Um, and that is so important in, in being able to hear these narratives and being able to, to serve people who are living with this pain and potentially helping them to find a different way forward. It is regaining our sense of worth and purpose and finding meaning in all of the seemingly senseless suffering and kind of putting order to some of this chaos that can help us to find, um, find what that way forward might be. And, and to give us a sense again of that viable future, you know, that there is a future, which is what can restore hope when we believe that a future is possible and that our present is not our forever. Brody continues that, that former quote by saying, suffering cannot be relieved, however elegant a cure one performs, unless the patient's subjective sense of split and isolation has been assuaged. Almost always, this assuagement requires a sense of reattachment to the human community from which the patient, through illness, has felt cut off. The physician is the human ambassador who most often and most directly can reach out and reestablish this sense of human connection. Her willingness to listen to the patient's story may be the first step in this process. So the first step in the process of relief of suffering is listening to the story that that person in pain that is seeking care um, is able to tell. I, I think that that is so important for me. One of the stories that I've, I've told a number of times is my conversation that I had with Laura Mosley when I was in graduate school and still trying to make sense of things. And, and it was a 45 minute conversation where I told him about pain science and asked him at the end what the one thing he would want people to know is and he responded with to love and be loved. And the profoundness of that entire conversation for me was not in all of the things that he said, but in the 45 minutes of listening to my story and having a conversation with me, human to human, person to person. It, it restored in me a sense that what I had to say was of worth and was of value, that I was a person of worth and of value, that I still had something to offer. And, and that cannot be highlighted enough. I think that we tend to downplay this, this idea of listening and it can be so restorative to that person's sense of, of value within themselves and what they have to offer the world and that sense of, of self-worth they might have lost. Um, this idea of the really of suffering too, um, Eric Cassell touches upon it when he says that suffering continues until the threat of disintegration has passed or the integrity of our person can be restored in some other manner. Recovery from suffering often involves help. I think it always involves help as though people who have lost parts of themselves can be sustained by the personhood of others until their own recovers. This is one of the latent functions of physicians, to lend strength. I think that that's a powerful quote too. And in all these places where it says physician, just we can say clinician or just even human, other human listening to these stories. But we have the ability to be the first person to listen to that story, reconnect someone with humanity 
restore to them the sense that, that what they have to say is of value and that they're worthy and also to lend them some of our own strength. Arthur Frank writes of how we need to tell stories in order to work through the situation we find ourselves in. And as long as the story continues to be told, um, that just indicates that we continue needing to do the work in order to work through it. And when that story is well heard, when we are afforded the ability to talk, we can gain some of that critical distance from the tale and begin to reflect on what is being told. We can reflect on what we're saying ourselves, which can allow us to start connecting some of our own dots, start coming to some of our own understandings and new meanings for what we have gone through and to start seeing new possibilities for the future and new paths forward that were obscured for so long by the malignant mist of pain, which is another quote by Drew Letter. Um, a, he writes of how the pain of a small and particular thing can totalize itself, and that that pain diffuses like a ma malignant mist throughout the experienced world, it kind of covers everything, obscures everything, except for the pain itself. Only in the telling of our stories does this mist begin to clear, so that alternative ways of thinking and doing and being can be made clear. And with each new retelling, new insights can be gained um, and new possibilities uncovered, new meanings discovered. Um, but we can't just be handed those, those insights. We can't be handed those new meanings. We can't just be handed a new narrative. They, we have to come to that ourselves, um, which doesn't mean that you don't play a role. Obviously, you play a role. It's in your very role as a good listener, that you can ask gentle questions, and guide the conversation, gauge our responses and adapt as necessary. It's about the dialogue, about what John Moner calls conversations inviting change, which is not about forcing or imposing change or demanding change, but conversations that invite change. Um, and, and through those conversations, you know, we can, we can have a deepened understanding of ourselves and what we've, we've experienced. Um, Frank writes that we all have our own story just right, just as it is, which doesn't mean that it can't change. It can, but the possibility of change does not make the current story wrong or pathological. It's not something that we have to jump in to fix or to move someone along to a better one. Um, he says that personal discoveries of meaning take place at unpredictable moments. Some people are prepared to make that discovery. So then how can we nurture that change without kind of trying to direct it? And I love his, his suggestion for nurturing that change, which is to hold the utterly sincere belief that the story you are hearing needs no change. And that is immensely difficult to do, but I think it is so, so very important. To hold the utter sincere belief that the story you are hearing needs no change. Because this is the ill person's whole life brought to you in this story. And it, when someone is suffering, when someone is in chaos in the abyss, it's no time for anyone to repudiate how their life was lived. Um, he also writes that the best opening to change may be the recognition that the story the person is now telling is a perfectly adequate representation of his or her experience, which it is, which I think is beautiful. But through these tellings too, we can, we can come to new understandings, and I love this, this quote by Frederick Svenhaus um, in The Phenom Phenomenology of Chronic Pain, Embodiment, and Alienation, another great paper. But the inevitable sufferings that a human being will be faced with in life can be worked through and in many cases developed into a deepened understanding of oneself and the human predicament, which brings us, sorry, brings us to the quest narrative taking a little quest through my slides here. Um, so, and again, although I've presented things kind of sequentially from restitution to chaos to quest, I want to be clear that, that it's not to suggest that that's the way that people should move through this. Um, some people are restored. They don't need to have any other kind of narratives. Some people never descend into chaos. Some people never exit the chaos. Um, so this isn't represented as some task to achieve, just, just kind of a, a framework for listening to stories that might be helpful. Um, for me, my quest was realizing, you know, that search for the Holy Grail of a fix, of a, of a cure, or being restored back to my old self was, was not going to happen. Um, and I, I tried to find a different way forward. 
my surgeon, who was an absolute wonderful human being, made the suggestion to me to get out of the workers' compensation system and find my own path. Um, and he was wonderful in the sense he never once made me feel like my pain was my fault or that it wasn't real. And was just very open and honest about how his ability to, to perform surgery was not what I needed and that I probably wasn't going to find what I needed along traditional routes. Um, so I went back to school and I studied pain science and movement and I came to a new understanding of pain, which allowed me to give new meaning to my experience. To, to put order to the chaos that I had been through and to kind of make some sense of my suffering and to make some sense of my pain. And then through that, I was able to make room for my pain so that there was room for other things that really mattered to me in my life. And I was able to, to reconnect with the things that really mattered to me, which I had a much clearer understanding of, having been through years of, of darkness in the abyss and the chaos. Um, I was able to see things from a new perspective, able to see things a bit differently by getting some of that distance through telling my story. And this for me didn't happen in healthcare. It happened through writing my blog where I, I told my story over and over again in a number of different ways. And I've been able to tell my story at conferences and in presentations. And through all of that reflection, being able to tell the story and reflecting upon what I'm saying has helped me to continue to understand what I've been through and to understand um, my own path forward. And through all of that, you know, it became, I, I, I would not wish my experiences on anyone, especially those, those three years that were really kind of dark and isolated and withdrawn from the world. It was a really, really difficult and challenging time and it sucked, the chaos sucks. It's incredibly difficult. I would not wish it upon anyone, but I also would not change my life for anything and I'm grateful for where I am now. Living with pain has taught me a lot about life and, and being human. Um, and, and that's what Arthur Frank calls kind of this quest narrative, where you can make sense of things, where you can use what you have learned to potentially share that with others who are experiencing similar difficulties. Um, to borrow some more of, of Arthur Frank's words, my life has been reclaimed and reconstructed. So it looks much different than I had planned for, than I expected, but it's a life that I'm grateful for. Um, it, I'm a new self, which is good. I think we should all become new selves as, as we age and, and move through difficulties and experiences. When I flare up now, though, it's both a reminder of the suck, of the chaos, and how awful and difficult living with ongoing pain is, and it's also a reminder of how lucky I am to live the life that I live. And that, kind of captures what a quest narrative is to me. So I'm not restored, I'm reconstructed, kind of a new me. So now I am finally gonna be wrapping up, I know I'm going over, but um, Howard Brody also writes that a clinician cannot offer a more satisfying explanation to the patient unless they first hear the patient out. If our narrative is just replaced by yours, we can't recognize it as our own. How could we? If you've never heard what we have to say, then it's just a generic story, a clinical story, a medical story, those privileged stories, legitimized stories that are with good intentions often offered to replace our story, which might be difficult to hear. Um, those stories, though, are not stories of human beings. They're not stories of us as a particular human being experiencing our own particular situation, our own human predicament. One of the things that John Lawner writes in, in his, his book as well is about approaching questions and approaching these conversations with curiosity. And I've tacked on exploration because I like exploring things. Uh, but who is this person? What is their life like? Are they able to make sense of their experience? What do they value? What matters to them? What worries them the most? So rather than just focusing on the pain or, or the problem, focusing on the person. And that could be to... A, a much better way forward, a much better um, or a much clearer path that can then be co-constructed between the two persons, the clinician and the person who is seeking care. And again, it, it's also about being curious and exploring your own narratives that you're bringing to the encounter. Because this is going to be a dialogue, it's going to be a conversation with another person. So what are you bringing to that encounter? What makes up your own stories, your own clinical stories or evidence-based stories or science stories? 
or you know treatment stories whatever they might be be curious and reflect upon what you believe and what you do and explore the foundations of those beliefs what were they built on and are there other ways of approaching encounters with patients and i hope that this talk will provide um like a jumping off point of, of approaching conversations with patients a little bit differently are there ways of being with rather than doing two that might serve not just your patients but yourself as well and again it's all about dialogue and having a conversation because the person that is seeking care needs to be involved throughout the process and not just handed that new narrative you know a scientific narrative or a pain science narrative or a predictive processing narrative or a protection narrative or whatever the the narrative of the day might be so it's about listening first with Brody's hypothesis in mind that we're coming to you with a story that we can't make sense of or that the only explanation we have for it is very frightening and we need your expertise and your guidance to help us make sense and find a way forward and it's truly about that conversation that invites change it's a dialogue not a, a monologue not a lecture and not education um, as, as we have come to know it. Recently, I had a great, the, the great pleasure of chatting with Mike Stewart with um, my co-hosts, Susan Quinton and Carolyn Van Dyken on the Genius Project podcast. And he describes education as a drawing out. So education is a drawing out, not a pouring in, which is how I tend to go about doing it. I fire hose people with information. But education should be more of a drawing out. It, it can be about asking gentle questions and offering comments and inviting reflection and seeing how those things are responded to and changing direction if needed or following a line of thought more thoroughly um, and meeting resistance with curiosity rather than insistence, which I think is really important too. And this is all about sharing too. It's two people coming together to have this dialogue in this, this conversation. It's sharing knowledge and expertise when and where they're appropriate. Um, we're coming to you for a reason. It's because you are an expert in this field of pain or rehabilita rehabilitation or health or whatever it might be. And that knowledge and expertise that you have are invaluable. But any new narrative that is, is co-created must be meaningful from the patient's point of view, no matter how sound it is, medically sound or scientifically sound it is. It has to be accepted about themselves and relevant to their lives and their values. It has to make biographical sense for that person in their lived life, out in the real complex, nuanced social world that they live in. It also has to make biological sense, and that's where you come in. It has to be medically sound. Your expertise is sought for a reason, and that expertise is really, really important and valuable, and we're really grateful that, that um, you have that knowledge to share. But it, it, is, it is about sharing your expertise in ways that make sense to that person and their life and their circumstances, and combining your expertise in science and health and rehab and pain or whatever it might be with the patient's expertise in their body, their values, their meanings, their lives, their story. So it's about conversation and exploration and reflection on both parts, both parties' parts. Um, and then that might open the door to new possibilities and new paths forward that are more therapeutic, more healing, more meaningful. Um, but it all starts with listening first. Always starts with listening first. Um, and I, I wanted to end this, this kind of summary with compassion because I think compassion is so important. Arthur Frank summarizes compassion as just listening. So I think that, again, it all comes back to that, just listening without trying to fix or replace. But it's also about having compassion for yourself too. This stuff is really, really hard. It's really difficult, not just for patients, but for the, the clinicians who are trying to serve those patients in the best way possible too. This is hard, challenging, difficult work. So be compassionate with yourself. We're not gonna get all of this stuff right. I get it wrong all of the time. Um, so we need to be compassionate with ourselves. And then that frees us up to be compassion, more compassionate with others. Um, and we also need to be able to receive compassion, which could be one of the most difficult things. So be compassionate with yourself, give compassion, receive compassion too. And all of this is all tied together. It's all about sitting with non-judgment and being with. Um, rather than kind of doing me too. So I'm gonna just end with two quotes. One is from Howard Brody, that the narrative physician, and again, we can refer to clinicians, 
knows that sometimes ob objective detachment is both necessary and comforting to the patient, but sometimes a compassionate vulnerability is required. The choice between them is dictated by what is necessary to empower the patient in the face of illness, rather than what will make the physician feel powerful. And he further says that mastering this approach to patient care requires an understanding that sometimes what seems to be an omission of powerlessness actually makes the clinician more powerful in terms of being able to genuinely help the patient. So I think that's so important, that the choice is dictated by what is necessary to empower the patient in face of pain or illness, rather than what makes the clinician powerful. So in summary, knowledge is socially constructed by groups of people coming together. We are a group of people, us pain people are a group of people coming together. We all have many narratives, which is knowledge represented about pain and about people. We have some very privileged and legitimized knowledge or stories out there, which influence all of our individual and institutional attitudes, biases, beliefs, approaches, policies, and the delivery of care. And we can change together some of those narratives and construct new knowledge, which is what I think we're all coming together around. To improve health outcomes, we must address structural violence, social suffering, and the social determinants of health. To be of service, we must listen first without trying to fix. And to keep in mind that once people are heard, seen, believed, and validated, there then may be space for conversations that invite change and unco uncover possibilities in treatment, and most importantly, uncover possibilities in the life of the person who is seeking care. And all of this I know is complex, and it seems difficult, and like this task can never be achieved, but we've thought that about all questions asked in modern medicine and science, that this is too unknowable and, and can't be done. But I argue that it, it can be known and can be done, that we can do better. My last quote to, to finish up is by Rachel Naomi Remen in her essay, the Serv In the Service of Life, that lastly, fixing and helping is the basis of curing, but not of healing. In 40 years of chronic illness, I have been helped by many people and fixed by a great many others who did not recognize my wholeness. All that fixing and helping left me wounded in some important and fundamental ways. Only service heals. Recognize our wholeness. Recognize our wholeness. Can't say that enough. And only service heals. Um, we're all in this together, and I thank you for listening.